All right, I want to show you real quickly uh, how to compute the capacity of a section if local buckling is going to be a problem. Now, to be clear, you don't need to worry about this for a homework or an exam or anything like that. This is just to show you that uh, some of this stuff that we might not have a chance to cover in class really isn't that tough. All you have to do is just read through the manual, and, and a lot of this stuff is, is straightforward. It's written so that if you just follow the steps, it works uh, pretty well. But while we're doing this, I'm also going to make sure that you understand the concept so that you're not just you know plugging and chugging into equations without getting the meaning. Uh, so I came up with the following example. It's a W21 by 44, um, and we're going to look at this as if it's a column, and we're going to compute the capacity. Now, um, if you remember, one of the things I said uh, in the lecture was uh, if you're ever looking at a shape that's being used for something other than its intended purpose, there's a chance that local buckling might happen or might be, be an issue. So this is a W21 by 44. That's typically a beam section because it's a W21. It's kind of deep. Uh, and instead, what we're going to do is look at it as if it was a column. Uh, so uh, I kept the column stuff pretty basic. It's just a 10 foot long column that's pinned on both sides. So the K in both direction, KX and KY are both going to be one. Uh, and LX and LY are both 10 feet. It's just pinned on both sides. Um, so KLX equals KLY equals 10 feet. This is a column, so we do need that to get KL over R and, and our uh, FCR value and all that. We're still going to have to go through all that. Um, so the first thing that I did is I uh, copy and pasted some stuff from the spec. I wanted to make sure it was clear where a lot of the stuff came from that we need. So let me get my mouse pointer over here and where did my mouse pointer go? There we go. Um, so the first thing that we need is the properties of a W21 by 44. Um, so this, uh, it, it seemed like there was a little bit of a mix up as to where some of these values were coming from. Keep in mind, uh, you know, the, um, you know, this is a column problem, so we'll need the area, we'll need the Rx, we'll need the Ry. Um, we're also going to need the uh, compact section criteria. This is the flange slenderness, and this is the web slenderness. Um, for this particular problem, we are going to need one extra dimension, and that's the web thickness. So I went ahead and wrote that down, um, but uh, normally, uh, if you were looking at a column problem, you wouldn't by default look that up because if the section is compact, you don't need that to compute the capacity. Uh, but I, being a little, uh, uh, have a little bit of precognition here, I know that we're going to need it. Um, so I just want to make sure everybody's clear on where those values are coming from. This is just table 1-1 uh, on page 1-20 and 1-21 because some of these uh, are, are from both sides of the page. Um, the next thing that we have to do is we have to classify the section and we're classifying it uh, according to compression. This is a column problem. We're taking this column and we're pushing it in compression. So we're off of B41A. Again, make sure that you're looking at the right table. This is the table related to compression. Okay, And this is where I think there was a little bit of uncertainty uh, in class. We're looking at unstiffened elements as well as stiffened elements. Remember for an eye shape, uh, this is going to be uh, where we look at the flange, and this is going to be where we look at the web. Now, we're looking at the flanges of rolled I shapes uh, because we're looking at a W shape in this problem, and so that's going to be our, our slenderness limit. Um, so if we go back to our previous notes, we have BF over 2TF. We had that as uh, 7.22. Let me get a little bit more in frame here. Uh, that was 7.22. And then we also have to look uh, or compute lambda RF. And so that's 0 0.56 square root of E over Fy. Um, I'm not going to go through and chug out all of these, but I can put out that, you know, I can do one of them, 0 0.56 square root of 29,000 KSI over 50. Now, when you chug this out, you get 13.49. Um, that's the same thing we got in class. Uh, sorry, 13.49. That's the same thing we got in class earlier. Uh, and so what that means is that the flange is compact, okay? Because our flange slenderness is 7.22 and the limit is 13.49. If the slenderness was over that limit, it would mean we have a slender flange. So this is a compact flange. Okay, but we're not gonna find that's the case with the, uh, with the web. Because the H over TW for the web um, uh, is 53.6. And if we compare that against its limit right here, because we're looking at case five, the web of a doubly symmetric section right here. So, oh, lost my pin there. So lambda RW 
is uh, 1.49 square root of e over fy, we get 35.89, okay? So that definitely means we have a slender web. And, and that should make sense if you think about what's going on. Um, just sort of make sure you have a little bit of insight here. So this is a beam section that's being used as a column. So it's a really, really deep section that's being loaded in compression. So it sort of makes sense that if anything was going to be slender, it would be the web. You know, that, that I think that kind of makes sense. Now, what happens from here? Okay, that's where we sort of stopped in class. Um, well, that doesn't mean that the column is unusable. It doesn't mean that if you put a feather on the column, it explodes. All it means is that we have to compute the capacity a little differently. And so I want to pull up the spec to kind of show you how that works. So this is chapter E of the specification. So we're in chapter E because um, that's the chapter for columns. We're looking at a column. And so some of this stuff should be familiar. Okay, so for instance, if I go down a couple pages and I scroll down, you know, here's the section on... Uh, buckling of columns. And if you look at the code, this is stuff that we've all seen before, right? This is the critical buckling stress, whether or not you're in the inelastic buckling range or the elastic buckling range. And so we compare our KL over R to 4.71 square to V over FY. We're either in the inelastic range or the elastic range. And then that tells us what our FCR is. And so these expressions should be pretty familiar. But I want to make sure that we have a global understanding of the code uh, as, a, uh, as a whole. This is the chapter that dictates how we assess columns in general. You know, the, ch the code doesn't care whether or not we're looking at, you know, conventional columns like a W shape, like a W14 in compression or anything in compression. It just writes the spec or the, the spec is presented such that you can compute the capacity of anything. So you need to look at how to address um, uh, the, the capacity of not only a section with compact elements, but a section with slender elements. Um, one of the nice things that's in these uh, later versions of the spec uh, are, are is this, these user notes. This is a really nifty user note. Let me blow, blow this up a bit. Um, this tells you as the designer what section of the code you need to be looking at for your given problem. So for example, if I was looking at, I don't know, a, um, uh, a tube, a, a, a pipe section. Let's say I had a column that was a pipe. Well, this se section tells me that if I have a, um, a section without slender elements, then I'm going to look at section E3. And if I have a section with slender elements, I'm going to look at section E7. Well, what we're focused on, obviously, is this. Okay, This is an eye shape. This is the type of uh, column that we're looking at. And it tells us right here that, well, you know, a section without slender elements. So we either look at section E3 or E4. E4 is the section for uh, torsional buckling modes, and that's not really not going to govern a, uh, an I-beam. You're more than welcome to do the math. I mean, it's a flow chart. It's a step-by-step -step process. You'll just see that, that, that it won't govern. Um, what we're going to do, though, is because we have a section with slender elements, I mean, it tells us we go to section E7. So turn the page a couple pages. So this is section E2, E3, E4, E5, E6, and E7. Here's the section with slender elements. Now, the way the, uh, the section works is if you want to compute the capacity of a slender element, basically what you do is you take um, the regular old buckling stress that we computed before, so we don't com compute that any differently. Uh, and instead, what we do is we compute a new area. Um, so the idea is we have the same buckling stress as before, but the area is going to be reduced a bit because we can't use all that area because of local buckling, that some of that area is ineffective. Um, that's actually a little bit different than the previous spec. The previous spec, what we did is we changed the stress and used the same area. Um, but there are reasons why the spec's updated. That's why, you know, you should read the commentary. It goes through all of that. Um, uh, but really, uh, to, to, to boil that, uh, there are some parameters in here that gives the engineer a little bit more freedom as to how to compute uh, some stuff when it's written this way, like the elastic buckling stress and, uh, and whatnot. Um, but the big point I want to get across is that this is stuff that you could sort of work on on your own. I've, uh, I've screen clipped a lot of this uh, section E7 into the, um, uh, into the uh, 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 notebook here so that we could go through it. So again, like I said, the idea is that we're computing a reduced area. If you look over here on the right, um, to keep this simple, what I did is I drew uh, an angle. And so the idea is that the angle has two legs. And let's say that top leg is, is slender. Okay. So the idea is that we have the gross area of the angle, which we can look up from the manual, and then we have this new effective area. 
Um, the idea is that we reduce that area a little bit to account for the fact that some of that angle uh, isn't effective because it's buckled. And so what we're going to do is we're going to compute uh, ultimately uh, phi pn as phi f critical AE. See, it used to be the gross area. Now we've got to compute this new area. Now, this isn't the same thing as tension members because we're not talking about bolts and shear lag and anything like that. What we're doing is reducing the area because some of it is buckled. Okay. Now, what we do is uh, in the spec, we are ultimately trying to compute this new width. And so if you look over here in the diagram, you can see there's a B term and then there's this BE term. So you can see that BE is reduced a bit. Uh, and so ultimately what we're trying to do is compute that so that we can get a new area. And the way that we're going to compute our area is it's just going to be, so how would you compute, you know, the effective net area using this diagram? Well, we would take the gross area minus that little nub off the end, this little nub right here that we're taking off because of the buckle. And what's the area of that? It's just B minus BE times, you know, whatever thickness. Um, what we're going to have to do for our problem is that reduction is going to be related to the web uh, because the web is what's slender. Um, so all we have to do is go through this flowchart. It's pretty straightforward. Um, I'm going to copy and paste this second page down here uh, because we're going to use this, um, this second page. So there's this um, page here and this page here. I'm going to copy and paste this because we're going to need it in a second. Um, but right now, all we're going to do is go through this, this process. We have to compute the new effective area, but we also have to compute F critical. And we do that the same as we did before. So let's, let's chug that out. So here's our steps to compute uh, uh, phi pn. And step one is to compute uh, F critical. And this is the same as before. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, we had a KLX and a KLY of, uh, sorry, 10 feet or 120 inches. Uh, we had an RX of, um, what was RX? Put that up here. RX is 8.06 and 1.26. 8.06 and RY is 1.26. So we can, you know, just like we did before, we can compute a KL over R for the X axis. So 120 divided by RX, that ends up being 14.89. And then KL over R for the Y axis, uh, so that's going to end up being 95.24. And just so everybody's clear, I'm, I'm uh, some of these calculations I'm sort of just writing down the answer because all I'm doing is taking, for instance, KL, uh, you know, 120 inches divided by RX, and then KL divided by RY. Uh, so, you know, some of this stuff we've done before, and I'm not going to try and uh, just you know make the video last longer. I think you all can probably follow along with me with some of these calculations. Um, so, you know, what do we do like we did before? So we take the maximum. So you know, take the one that governs, that's going to be the larger one, right? And then we say, okay, Fe is pi squared times E all over KL over R squared, right? So pi squared times 29,000 divided by uh, 95 squared. Uh, and so that ends up being like 31.56 KSI. And then the next thing that we do is we compare um, KL over R, which is 95.24. We compare that with 4.71 square root of E over FY. And so this is the same thing for stuff we've done before. Uh, so this ends up being 113.4. Uh, uh, and so comparing these two, we then know um, that F critical is uh, 0 0.658 raised to the Fy over Fe, all times Fy. So this should be a really good review for computing column capacity before. We're going to do some new stuff here in a bit, but you should have done, you should be familiar with a lot of this. And so when you chug that out, you get 25.76 KSI. So we're going to take phi of 0.9 times that stress times an area. We haven't done the area yet, that's new. 
But that should be uh, pretty straightforward. Okay, so step two, um, what we have to do is uh, we have to start going into this local buckling uh, uh, section. Now what I'm going to do first is I'm going to go back to this and I'm going to compute some base values. So I'm going to write here compute base values. Here, I have an extra dash. I don't need that. Sometimes the way that these uh, spec documents work, the if you go if you scroll up a bit, um, you know the code tells you, you know, are we going to do you know this highlighted box? Are we doing B E or are we doing B? Uh, or, or, you know, B E either equals B or B E equals B times this uh, stuff here on the bottom of the page. But in order to get to this point, there's a lot of background calcs that you need to do. And so sometimes it's easier to actually start at the end and, and work your way back. And so that's what I'm going to do. Um, so first off, uh, let's see what we can uh, figure out from this, uh, from this document here. So we've got B, C1, C2, all of this. Let's see if we can figure out the C1 and C2. Uh, we're looking at a web in this instance because the web is what's slender. So we're going to look at uh, stiffened elements except walls of, or, uh, of square or rectangular HSS because we're looking at an I-beam. And so here's our C1 and C2. So C1 is 0 0.18 inches or 0 0.18 and C2 is 1.31. Uh, and you can see they, they just have that listed uh, right here. The C2, you could actually compute the C2 if you want, but it gives it to you, so no, no reason uh, not to just use that. Uh, next, we need lambda and lambda r. Now, lambda is the actual slenderness of the element, and so that's h over tw. We actually already did that, That's uh, or already looked that up. That's 53.6. And lambda r, that's the limiting width to thickness ratio defined in table B41A. That was 1.49 square root of E over Fy. We already computed that. Uh, and so that's 35.89. So we already got that. Uh, got this, got that. Uh, what else? We need the um, this FEL term. And so FEL, if you're wondering what it is, that is the stress, the elastic stress at which a buckle would occur. And so you can, a local buckle, I should say. And so you compute that by taking C2 times the ratio of these, um, times the ratio of these two slenderness ratios, square all that and multiply it by Fy. Um, the reason why the spec is written this way is because what we're doing now is sort of a shortcut to get this FEL term. Uh, but you, if you wanted, you could do some more advanced uh, computer analysis, so, you know, some finite element stuff or what have you to actually determine um, uh, this, you know, your own way. That's one of the reasons why the spec is written like this. You can use the spec or you can do your own thing as long as the engineer of record uh, is on board with that. Um, when you check all this out, because we've got everything we need, we get 38.46 KSI. So um, right off the bat, if that was less than 50, that'd probably be a problem. So because the yield stress is 50, it's got to be elastic. So make sure that you're uh, good with that. And so that's all of this. Um, the only thing that we probably need is the B distance. Now for us, B is going to be H. It's gonna be the web height because it's the web that's buckling. But if you remember the web height wasn't given, we actually have to compute that. So what we're gonna do is take H over TW times TW. That's how we're gonna get that. So um, H is going to be, um, uh, H is going to be uh, 53, 0.6 times the slenderness, or sorry, the, the web thickness, and the web thickness was 0 0.350 inches. And when you chug all of that out, you get uh, 18.76 inches. So there you go, not too bad. Okay, so once you get uh, that, uh, all your next step is you have to compute your effective width. So let me copy that from up here. That's this page. So, so again, what we're trying to determine is what we're looking at here. So when this limit is satisfied, then B, B sub B is just B. 
otherwise it's this. So what I'll do is repeat some of the values that we need. So lambda is 53.6, uh, lambda r is 35, 35.89. Already looked up C1 and C2. C1 and C2 were 0 0.18 and 1.31. Uh, we just computed FEL, sorry, let me, let me write that over here. So we just computed FEL and we got 38.46. And we're actually going to use that F critical term we computed a while back and that was 25.76 KSI. So what we've got to do is we've got to look at lambda and this limit. So lambda is 53.6. And then we're looking at this right there. So lambda r times the square root of Fy, which is 50 KSI, over F critical. Now, if you chug that out, you get a value of just under 50, 49.99. And so since lambda is greater than this, That means that we're going to be using this lower expression. Now, what I'm going to do is write it in terms of H. And so, again, looks nasty, but it's just plug and chug. We've got everything we need. So we take H times this quantity in here. Uh, and so we have H, we computed that, it was 18.76 inches. When you chug all this out, you will get H E is 17.88 uh, inches. And there you go. So from here on out, all we have to do is, so step four is just to compute the capacity. So we have phi of 0 0.9, we have F critical of 25.76 KSI, right? And we have um, H of 18.76, HE of 17.88. And again, another gut check, uh, HE should be a little less because remember there's the height of the web, and then there's the effective height of the web because it's reduced a little bit because some of that web is buckled. Uh, AG is 13.0 inches squared, and TW is 0 0.35 inches. Again, just repeating a lot of the properties that we've already uh, written down. So compute that effective uh, area. So AG minus, and so what we're going to do is we're going to take out that ineffective section of the web, multiply it by the web thickness. And so we've got everything here. Uh, we chug that out, we get 12.69. And phi PN is 0.9 F critical. And in this case, it's AE, okay? So phi PN when you chug it out, ends up being 294.3 kips. Now, one thing to, or two things to point out before we close it out. Um, again, or, well, I guess, uh, uh, <laughs> I guess three. Um, first off, um, if you were to ignore all this local buckling stuff and just compute the capacity of this column, learning everything we did in the class, you know, the just take the F critical and multiply it by AG, you'd be overestimating the capacity. In fact, if you do that and you compare um, the, the column capacity doing it the right way where you account for local buckling versus what I would call doing it the wrong way, which is just doing it, you know, with AG here, 
um, you end up overestimating the capacity a bit. It's not a lot. If you compare this to the 0.9F critical AG capacity, it comes out to about 97.6%. So again, it's a little less. Um, the second point I want to show you is there's a design aid in the manual that you can use to actually um, look this capacity up. We haven't used this in the class yet because there's a lot of information in this table and I think sometimes it might be better um, to just sort of forego it uh, for the class purposes because there's a lot here. But this is in the manual. This is in section 6 of the manual. This is table 6-2. Uh, sometimes uh, it's called the super table because literally everything is in this table. Um, but I, I don't like showing it or using it in class because there's just so much here that it's that it, it's kind of difficult to navigate. If I uh, fast forward through a couple of pages, um, let me see if I can find the W um, the W twenty one. Sorry, um, let me see if I can find the W twenty one by um, forty four. See, I'm getting close. Uh, let's try six dash. Here we go. I think it's probably one more page. Perfect. Okay, so if I zoom in, this is on page six dash fifty seven. What this table does is it lists every capacity. Um, for the axial load, for bending moment, for tension members, compression members, all of it, all in one table. So for instance, if I look at the W21 by 44, that's 10, um, that's, let's see, W21 by 44, I'm looking at its compressive capacity. Over here is the moment capacity. If I look at its compressive capacity over here on the left, if it is 10 feet long, its capacity is 294 kips, which is exactly what we just computed. So there is something in the spec that you can use to, to verify this. Um, uh, so, you know, first point is, um, you know, you can, you can verify this. Second is, it, you know, you do need to do this because you would re reduce the capacity. But here's the real big point. Nothing that I did here is, is nothing that you couldn't figure out by reviewing the manual. I mean, the manual tells you how to do this, and a lot of this is very plug and chug. Um, when you all graduate, if many of you go into the, the steel design sector, um, you might be faced with problems that uh, you've never done before. And there's plenty of resources that, the, um, uh, on AISC's website. The manual itself is a wealth of information. It's really worth taking some time uh, and digging into. Because again, um, uh, this isn't that hard. I know everybody uh, in the class can, can handle this stuff on their own. Now again, to be crystal clear, I'm not worried about uh, this on the final. In fact, the, really the only thing I want you to be able to do for local buckling is just this. I just want you to be able, be able to classify the section uh, according to its uh, behavior. And, and, and other than just generally understanding it, you're good. But again, the big point is this, all, this isn't uh, all that difficult. Uh, that's all I have, everybody. I will see you on the exam review uh, on Friday.